Now for today's program. Ted Deutsch became CEO of American Jewish Committee in October 2022 after serving more than 12 years as a member of Congress, representing Broward and Palm Beach counties in Florida. A lifelong Jewish and pro-Israel activist, he collaborated closely with members on both sides of the aisle to advance the security interests of the United States, Israel, and their allies, and chaired the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism Subcommittee. As a founding co-chair of the House Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Antisemitism, Ted spoke passionately on the House floor, confronting colleagues who invoked anti-Semitic tropes or disparaged Israel. In response to rising hatred on social media, he helped launch an interparliamentary coalition to combat online anti-Semitism with legislators from Canada, Israel, the United Kingdom, and Australia. Ted also served as co-chair of the Congressional Hellenic Israel Alliance, as well as a member of the Congressional Caucus on Black Jewish Relations, the Latino Jewish Congressional Caucus, and AJC's Transatlantic Friends of Israel Interparliamentary Group. Ted has long championed the priorities of the Jewish community, from his summers at Camp Ramah to his Israel activism as a college student and later as a lay leader with the Jewish Federation. Joining Ted today is Robert Siegel. Robert was the senior host of NPR's award-winning evening news magazine, All Things Considered, for 30 years. In 2019, he was awarded the Edward Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award in Journalism. He has been honored with three silver batons from Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University, as well as the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award. Currently, he hosts Navigating the New Abnormal, a series of web seminars sponsored by American Friends of Rabin Medical Center on the JBS, Jewish Broadcasting Service Television Network. Robert is a special literary contributor to Moment Magazine and serves on the advisory board for Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative. Please welcome Ted Deutsch and Robert Siegel. Ted Deutsch, welcome. It's great to have you here. It's uh, terrific to be here. Thanks. Uh, you'd be welcome anytime, but uh, this is a newsworthy moment because the American Jewish Committee recently uh, released its uh, I guess fourth annual uh, State of Anti-Semitism in America report, a survey of both American Jews and how they perceive our situation, how we perceive our situation, and Americans in general, and then compared the results. And I'm, I'm curious first to hear from you, uh, from this year's survey, what what leaps out at you as a, as, as an important number that you discovered? Um, I'll tell you there there are several important numbers that jump out. I, first, I, I do want to say how much I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you, and um, and I commend Moment. I think uh, Edgar Carrot, Alicia Wiesel, and, and Josh Rogan. Um, uh, soon on my heels, uh, that things will, uh, the, the programs will only, uh, <laughs> I think, enhance the reputation of the moment after I leave. I, I am, I'm struck. I think we're all struck, Robert, by the, the top line here. And that's 41% of Jews in the United States feel less secure about their status as Jews in America than they did a year ago. That's a 10 percentage point jump from the 21, uh, 2021 survey. And it's a, I mean, really what it is, is confirmation of what we know, what we feel, what we're talking about in our community, which is this great uneasiness that grips the community because of rising anti-Semitism. By far the, the biggest experience, uh, personal experience of anti-Semitism that you, your survey finds is online. Uh, it's it's primarily in, 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 in social media. Jews encountering anti-Semitic remarks either directed at them personally or that are uh, just just out there. Uh, and uh, I guess the question I have for you, a question that rises for me is uh, the digital sphere being the uh, in the golden age of unhinged extremism, everyone a publisher, no one an editor, uh, open space for the craziest ideas. Is that is that particularly a problem of anti-Semitism or is it a problem of uh, hateful speech having free reign in 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 uh, social media. Well, they're they're obviously related, and yes, it's anti-Semitism, and yes, it's hatred, and yes, it's conspiracy theories, and it's it's everything else that that is um, that is uh, allowed to run wild on social media. The numbers in our survey prove this: more than two thirds of American Jews who were polled said that they had seen anti-Semitic content online, more than 57% saw it more than once. And, and I think that the number that's the 
most important, frankly, is given given online the online lives that young people lead, 85% of American Jewish adults under age 30 have seen or were the target of anti-Semitism at least once in the past year. Uh, and for one in four young Americans, young American Jews, uh, that anti-Semitism that they experienced online made them feel physically threatened. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, we there's an issue. This isn't this isn't news to any of us who have lived uh, through the past decade. Of course, there's an issue with social media, uh, but this is just a reminder. Our survey tells us that when it comes to the Jewish community, we are feeling it uh, especially. And as a result, I think it, it, it requires us to be clear about the kinds of steps that social media should be taking to help keep our community and in turn uh, our democracy safe. Well, what what should social media, what steps should they be taking? And uh, should they be taking them or should the government be taking them and, and telling social media yeah. what to do? Well, look, there are some things that social media companies uh, can do. Some of them have already done. Social media companies uh, have hate speech policies. Mm -hmm. uh, more of them have, have robust policies compared to just five years ago. But But for some of them, uh, where American Jews fit in is is the question. We need more than than lip service. We can't just we can't just talk about hate speech. We have to specifically include anti-Semitism. Companies have the technology. This is something Robert that I dealt with consistently when I was a member of Congress. Companies have the the technology to remove anti-Semitic content that violates their policies. And they can strengthen their hate speech and harassment policies to include all of the forms of contemporary anti-Semitism and artificial intelligence, which is now the focus of so much of our attention, chat GPT. And just today, I believe, as we're as we're having this conversation, mm -hmm. Google is rolling out, yeah. I think, the, the Bard, right? Clever. Um, their their new uh, AI driven um, effort. And this can be used to more consistently remove the anti-Semitic language that poses a threat to the Jewish community. So there's a lot that they can do. They they can, and this is something that this doesn't just apply to anti-Semitism, but overall they can ensure transparency in, in the drafting of their policies and the algorithms that are used, the moderation systems that they use, the, the correct algorithms that don't allow for and encourage the spread of hate and anti-Semitism across the platform. And so making it easier to report anti-Semitism is important. Community standards matter. There's there's a lot they can do, but ultimately, as you point out, this is all, we're having this discussion even as Congress continues to focus on, on the extent to which social media companies have the ability, the freedom to do what they will without incurring any liability because of the protections that the law gives them. Uh, you would you would repeal that that uh, uh, immunity to uh, uh, that oh I, I, indemnification. I, well, I, I think that I think we should have a conversation about whether there are limits on that indemnification. Yeah. Certainly, but but um, uh, is this still a uh, a question uh, for? organizations like the American Jewish Committee or the Anti-Defamation League or the NAACP, for that matter, to, yeah. to be bringing to, to uh, big social media companies and urging them to do, or should they be bringing it to congressmen and urging them to, to, to pass laws that would require such, uh, such uh, measures as you've described? Well, on this one, I, I have a bit of a unique perspective, okay. uh, yeah. having, having played both roles. And I, I can... It, but this is not something that you have to be a member. One needs to be a member of Congress to appreciate when there are efforts to do anything in Congress that might uh, have a significant impact on large institutions in America. There's going to be there's going to be a lot of debate and there's going to be a lot of pushback and there will be narratives created to help protect interests. That's that's how politics work. It, we all know that. The role that AJC plays, the role that groups like like ours and and so many others in the community play, is 
is to bring in the necessary outside voices of the people who are experiencing the the results of what happens when companies make decisions and Congress looks the other way. And that's that's I, I think and it's imperative that we continue to point out the kind of data that our survey shows so that it can inform the the policy debate that's taking place in Washington and around the world, frankly. Mm-hmm. Uh, while there are uh, uh, several disturbing findings in your in, in in the survey published by the American Jewish Committee, there are also uh, some very encouraging findings. I I, I thought at least uh, when Americans were asked uh, about the Holocaust and when did it happen between uh, 1890 and 1910 or 1910 and 1930, 1930, 1950. I mean, 76 percent of the people got it right, given five choices. I think. Uh, there are surveys in which, you know, one of my favorites uh, a couple of years ago was uh, uh, more than half of 2,500 Americans surveyed couldn't name the three branches of government. Uh, 34% of one survey thought that Benjamin Franklin invented the light bulb. I mean, Americans score terribly on these sorts of things, but on the question of when the Holocaust happened, what was Auschwitz, there there are very high grades. So there seems to be some some successful public formal or informal education that's taken place. There's been a really serious effort to uh, to to ensure that Holocaust education is taught. I, I don't want I certainly don't want to get into an argument about whether it's more important for someone to know uh, who Thomas Edison was versus right. what the Holocaust was. That said, you're right. There were some encouraging signs. The fact that barely half of those surveyed knew that six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust is concerning um, if we think about the conversations, the broader conversations about democracy, the strength of democracy, and and then layer that onto the this conversation and with the understanding that less than 40% of the people surveyed knew that Hitler had been democratically elected. And that's concerning also. But the fact that, that we're having these conversations matters, an understanding of the Holocaust matters obviously there have been there's been a, a huge increase in the number of of holocaust museums that have been constructed but that's that's one that's one piece of this the holocaust message has been universalized in in many places we have to always act to ensure that it doesn't happen again to any people yes. at the same time there are specific threats to the jewish community the rise of anti-semitism that we also have to respond to right now there's there's a new uh, Pew survey that that came out uh, the other day uh, by by coincidence uh, that asked Americans if they held a favorable or unfavorable view of a, of different religious groups in America, uh, and the majority in in response to each of these half dozen groups was I don't have an opinion or I don't have to say anything, but the the number one. Uh, in terms of uh, favorable views uh, exceeding unfavorable views. Uh, you know, top of the charts, uh, right ahead of mainline Protestants, were Jews, uh, uh, s- suggesting that um, uh, issues of anti-Semitism are are not uh, deep, broad, mainstream ideas in American life. They're there, they're dangerous, but uh, the situation of American Jews is 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 not one of being a barely tolerated minority. People generally seem to feel pretty good about us being here and and in fact that that study also shows that uh those numbers are lowest in parts of the country where there aren't large jewish populations yeah yeah yeah. right to know us is to love us i guess but but the that's i don't think it's um what while while i would obviously we would all rather prefer those numbers uh the fact that that we are um, in in many ways well liked, and and it's more I think a reflection of the fact that that Jews are accepted in society. There, for the most part, that's terrific. But because of what we were talking about, because yeah. the internet allows one person to spread virulent anti-Semitism, that then invites the anti-Semites who have always been out there, but invites them out from under the rock when. When Kanye 
tweets about going DEFCON 3 on Jews, yeah. that then leads to the anti-Semites unfurling banners across highway overpasses and projecting anti-Semitic statements and swastikas on football stadiums and other buildings and depositing leaflets in Jewish neighborhoods in parts of all parts of the country. And this, we have to be clear, this rise in violence against identifiable Jews uh, that we have seen over the past several years, it, it can simultaneously be true that uh, yeah. that it may that the Jewish community is accepted, and at the same time, the Jewish community can feel under threat because of the increase of anti-Semitism online and in real life. And 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 in real life, you're saying might be uh, much more palpable uh, in a uh, in a yeah. Hasidic community, for example, where that uh, where people are are as you say visibly. Uh, Jewish by their entire well, yeah uh, yes that's true and we've actually we, we've we've seen that play out but we've also our survey also showed that 40 percent of American Jews say, say that they have changed their behavior in public to avoid being identified as Jewish they are they are more likely to put away a kippah hide their their Magen David stop posting support for Israel online this is uh, this is enormously concerning as we project out into the future and what it means not just to be Jewish, but to be proudly Jewish, openly and identifiably Jewish. Uh, and, and the presence of that anti-Semitism always affects more than the Jews. It's the, the entire society that ultimately is at risk if we simply sit back and allow the anti-Semites to, to dictate what kind of behavior the broader community is going to engage in. Uh, you mentioned Kanye West, as he was formerly known, uh, uh, and uh, I believe that just around the time that uh, the uh, AJC's survey was being taken, there was a tremendous amount of discussion of what Kanye West had said and uh, uh, NBA star Kyrie Irving's taste in documentary films, uh, uh, and this led to a great deal of writing about uh, black Jewish relations uh, in, in America. Uh, in your companion survey, you, you surveyed both American Jews and Americans at large. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't do a demographic break uh, breakdown, or at yeah. least not one that I've seen. Um, uh, and I'm just curious, why not? Uh, why not know whether, well, we, whether young people are more or less anti-Semitic than older people or members of minority groups, whatever? Yeah. You know, there's, there's data. Uh, this is an ongoing question from year to year. Which data do we gather? How much... Um, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And I think there's separate polling on, on some of these issues, um, some of which we've done previously, some of which I think is important for us to look at. Um, I, I would I, I, I would point out, though, that we know from the work that AJC does, the intergroup work that we do uh, in, in Black Jewish relations, the work that we do with the Hispanic community, formal relationship we've established with significant organizations in, in uh, some of these communities, the work that we do uh, on the interreligious, in the interreligious space, our Muslim Jewish Advisory Council. Well, mm -hmm. all of that work gives us uh, insight into communities and, and helps us lift up one another. It's really, really important Regardless, I don't need data uh, for me to understand the importance of working with other minority groups that we know feel uh, under threat uh, in some at so many instances uh, in our country. So the the work that we do, I was at a program in Philadelphia. We had leaders of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. I mean, this is mm -hmm. this is the kind of work that's central to what we do, and it's a, a really important part of moving all of this forward, not just for the good of the Jewish community, but ultimately for the good of American society as a whole. The other big question that I wanted to, to ask you about, in addition to anti-Semitism and the, the committee's survey, uh, is what's happening in Israel. Uh, and uh, first, uh, what the American Jewish Committee, or what you, for that matter, in, in individually think is appropriate uh, for the committee or for individual Jews to say or do about what's going on there. Well, look, I think we we start with an acknowledgement that uh, for those of us who who care deeply about what happens in Israel, uh, it is impossible, uh, I think, as uh, as hundreds of thousands of people march in the streets to not get 
get drawn in to learn more uh, about what's happening there. The the attention paid to to the ins and outs of what's happening in the Knesset with judicial reform, uh, the level of of knowledge that people in our community and the Jewish community here in America have, uh, I think is stunning, but it speaks to that kind of close relationship. AJC's position has been clear from the start. Uh, whether or not there's going to be reform of the judicial system is not, that's not my, it's not our call. We don't, there, there was an election in Israel. They make decisions about what happens in their government. That said, uh, we have been clear that given the importance of, of the shared democracy that the United States and Israel enjoy, when we talk about U.S.-Israel relations, we talk about those shared values, democracy being central among them, that if they're going to make changes that impact the institutions that are fundamental to democracy, that that process ought to be thoughtful and deliberative and that it it ought to respect civil liberties and, and minority rights. Uh, we said that, I said that when I was in Israel, as this process was starting, uh, we continue to say it. And thus far, the process, both procedurally and substantively, doesn't meet those requirements. It's why we've been so supportive of President Herzog's efforts to try to forge compromise. Uh, it's it's in the best interest of, of Israel to try to bring the parties together in a way that, again, will sustain Israeli democracy and allow us to focus on the tremendous opportunities that Israel has through the Abraham Accords, the threats that Israel faces as Iran moves forward. That's how we're approaching it. That's different from, I mean, I, I... I understand, but it's different from saying uh, we we support the uh, the protests against changing the Israeli Supreme Court and how it uh, how its rulings can be overridden. You, that that is that is farther from uh, 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 that, that's a a more hands off well, uh, attitude than what you're describe. Uh, ex- excuse me, well, you're describing a more hands off attitude than that. Uh, well, I think I think it's just I think we're being clear about about what. Ha- what we think the result should be and how this should be handled. I, I you'd have to, you'd have to ask the 260,000 people who protested last weekend. I'm sure they have lots of different ideas on exactly what judicial reform should look like and what, where the government should go and the decisions that the Knesset should make from our perspective, uh, again, with democracy being so central to the shared values that we have, I, I think it's appropriate for us to, to point out that, minority rights and civil liberties are critical here. I think that's probably what you would hear if you spoke to to lots of the people who are protesting. We're just focusing on on the substance rather than uh, rather than where people are and how people are expressing themselves. We're trying you, to speak on behalf of our folks. Sure. Let me push you a little bit further. Uh, would, sure. would you be, would you be willing to say that um, American Jewish organizations uh, should not uh, dabble in Israeli political debates uh, beyond uh, the the lengths that Benjamin Netanyahu uh, would dabble in American uh, uh, political decisions. That uh, uh, and indeed, if if, uh, if 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 it if if indeed Mr. Netanyahu felt uh, okay about dabbling in American politics, then we should feel equally okay about dabbling in Israeli politics. Uh, the way that. I the way AJC is approaching this, and I think it's frankly, Robert, the way most American Jews are thinking about this. We we know that nearly 90 for nearly 90 percent of American Jews, Israel is an important part of their identity. As a result, the things that happen in Israel are important to us as well. Uh, When I was in Israel last there were two issues that were, it's important, I think, to point this out, two issues that were front and center. One was this issue of judicial reform. The other was the conversation taking place about potential changes to the law of, of return. Now, mm-hmm. I, I made clear, we made clear in our visit that any changes to the law of return that would make even one Jew anywhere in the world feel less welcome in Israel is a threat to Israel diaspora relations that we can't have. And I think that 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 message was heard. We've not we've not seen much action in that space. We had a right to speak out about that because mm-hmm. of the importance of Israel diaspora relations. We have, I think, the ability and the need to make clear how we view, in this case, 
decisions that are going to affect the future of Israeli democracy because of not just how they impact Israel, but Israel is the Jewish nation state. We all have a vested interest in what happens there. I think it's appropriate for us to express our opinions. Uh, I should, to return to the survey, I should say, when you asked both American Jews and Americans at large, do you think it's anti-Semitic to say that uh, Israel has no right to exist? Both groups, ninety percent said, "Yeah, that's anti-Semitic to uh, uh, to 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 say that." And um, when you ask them about uh, about BDS, the boycott, divest, uh, sanction mm-hmm. movement, which is a you know a, a great concern to Jewish organizations, uh, two thirds of Americans had no idea what you were talking about. They they had never heard of this. Um, so um, Israel does not seem to be a, a deeply uh, divisive issue between. American Jews and 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 the rest of American society at all. Right. Uh, positive well, news. Well, I, I it's a, the important. I think that's right. And the important point there is that despite the efforts of a uh, of a minority of of uh, activists to try to undermine support for is, Israel in the United States, to try to divide the the Jewish community from others. Uh, to question the very legitimacy of uh, of having one Jewish state, those those who uh, those who point out uh, who suggest that there is only one country in the world that has no right to exist, and that's the Jewish state. Despite all of those efforts, uh, they're failing. It requires a, a vigilance on on our part. It's a big part of what we do at AJC and and, and others as well. Uh, but they're not succeeding, and. Uh, and part of that is because of the connection that people feel uh, people feel to Israel and and our understanding of what it's actually like uh, when when you visit. One of the things that HAC does through our Project Interchange program is to is to take elected officials and uh, and education officials and business leaders and others to Israel. We all know that there it's just different when you see it up close. Interestingly, just one last point here. Interestingly, when we're watching the the protests, it's a reminder that even as we're talking about democracy in Israel, this is democracy on full display. In Iran, when people go out to march in the streets, they're gunned down. Women go out leading to lead protests. They're gunned down by their own government. Uh, in Israel, it's 250, 300,000 people around the country making their voices heard. That's a really important reminder of how different Israel is from all of the other countries in the region. Uh, I mean, r- right now, one one concern one hears uh, from Israelis uh, quite often about what's going on there uh, is that the uh, uh, what Reuben Rivlin, the former president of Israel, I think used to refer to as the different tribes of Israel, uh, they're, they're, they're at each other's throats. Uh, the uh, uh, secular... Uh, Jewish society uh, based predominantly around uh, Tel Aviv, the Haredi uh, society, which is uh, uh, part of the current governing coalition, the, the settler uh, segment of society, uh, and of course the Israeli Arab uh, segment of, of society. Um, uh, Israel is facing some risks of, of, uh, of division and, and, and fragmentation here. I just wonder Looking at the American Jewish community, uh, which you represent, are mm-hmm. we um, are we more united than that? I mean, we we don't have the responsibility of of, of running the government, although uh, I could mention the Secretary of <laughs> Treasury, State, and and um, the Attorney General. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, what, what what is your sense of of unity or division among American Jews? Yeah, it's a it's a really important question. First, I would point out in Israel, though, Robert, mm-hmm. I I understand that the focus on this moment and the suggestion of of real division and 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 people battling one another. Uh, let's I think it's important to remember that if we were having this conversation just a year ago, the conversation would instead have been about this miraculous government in Israel that reflects the broad cross section of Israel with an Arab minister and the far left and the far right all coming together to form a government in a, in a government that's unlike virtually any that you'd find anywhere else in the world. Uh, 
and at that moment we did celebrate that and and that was probably a little overstated because it was temporary yeah. likewise at this at this moment i think it's important to remember this is a government and i don't i don't know means that that what we experienced before is necessarily gone forever when you have elections on a regular basis as israel does things change so i, I think it's important to make that point as far as the united states goes uh, i I think about these issues a lot. We have a big our our Jewish community, though still obviously a fraction, just two and a half percent of America at large, is is diverse and and our American Jewish community is is diverse both in how we identify and and how we practice our faith and uh, and there are. Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews and Jews of color. And we're, I mean, it's a, it's a, a big diverse group and it's really important for us. I believe, and I think that the survey results prove this, uh, it's really important to, to remind one another how much we have at stake here, both in terms of a history that has contributed so much to America and the growth of America from its founding uh, and uh, and a, a future that uh, that is that that could be equally bright if we recognize the strength that we have and the great diversity that, that's ever everywhere in the American Jewish community. Um, do do you uh, well? There is, and I, I'm I'm going by what I read in Yedio Dachrono yeah. online and 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 arts. Yeah. Um, there obviously are uh, are uh, uh, some divisions between the Haredi community of, of, of Israel and the secular Jewish uh, community there. Um, uh, and I've, I, in reading about Meir Kahana recently, I remember uh, uh, reading about this the sense of resentment that he helped cultivate uh, that uh, Jews in the inner city, uh, perhaps who who dressed uh, traditionally. Uh, experienced a kind of a street corner anti-Semitism and felt abandoned by the big Jewish organizations whose constituencies were were more in the Great Necks and Scarsdales of the of, of the country. Um, does the American Jewish Committee have uh, regular talks with leaders of the Hasidic or other uh, uh, Haredi communities? Yeah, I I think it's important as as AJC does our work. Uh, as a global advocacy organization for the Jewish people, there are 15 million Jews in the world. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we can somehow decide that advocating for one part of the Jewish community uh, as opposed to a different part of the Jewish community somehow advances the interest of our community as a whole, that it makes no sense. And so Sure, since I started over the past six months, I've reached out to all different parts of the Jewish community to, to make sure that uh, that we're building those relationships that reflect the full diversity of who we are as people. Uh, returning to the to the Holocaust uh, uh, for a moment, uh, as you mentioned, you were, you were disappointed that only 53 percent of the of the people uh, surveyed could guess uh, the six million number. Although there were, you know, there were quite a few went along with three million. I mean, yeah. as I, I happen to, uh, have, having seen these surveys of what Americans know of, of history over the years, uh, I, I think actually they're they're, they're pretty high numbers. Uh, but but um, uh, Dara Horn, the the, the novelist, uh, uh, yeah. wrote a book and, and the title essay, uh, "People Love Dead Jews," uh, and uh, Dara, in a in a recent panel that I was moderating, was was raising the question of have we have, have have we put too much emphasis uh, on on the Holocaust as opposed to Jews as we are today, living people? Uh, as she said, you know the the uh, uh, a, a two thousand year old book club and the the inventors of the weekend. Um, are we are we uh, uh, promoting uh, Jewishness and Judaism uh, in in a way that is contemporary, as opposed to uh, a horrid, atrocious, criminal act that is fading into history. Uh, and, and is it easier, are, are, we, are we asking people to, to love Anne Frank as opposed to 
just be good neighbors to the Jew down the street from you right now. So, I, right. So da- I've I've had this conversation with Dara yeah. as well, and and I there are some some parts of this that I agree with her completely. Uh, it is now we're now approaching the end of March, and uh, as we as we approach the observance of Jewish American Heritage Month in May. Uh, it is a, a really important reminder of exactly what Dara talks about, which is we, yes, uh, it's important to remember the Holocaust and it's important for us to fight anti-Semitism. But if, if the, if we're defining who we are as a Jewish people by the way we respond to those who hate Jews and the only history that we're focused on is yeah. the near annihilation of the Jewish people that and the Holocaust, that's not a long-term recipe for success. And so we're coming up to Jewish American Heritage Month where AJC is working with businesses across the country and, and governments and elected officials to do exactly what she says, exactly what, what you just pointed out, which is to celebrate the lived experiences of Jews in America. This is a, a moment where we can reflect on on exactly what Jews have meant in the history of our country. Yes, the challenges that we face, but also the incredible successes that that we've had and the achievements and the contributions. And and in so doing, and and this is the important part, it, it, it reflects on everything we've just been discussing. As we do that, it reminds us all how much we have in common. And yes, it's the weekend, and yes, it's the the belief in the inherent value of every human being, mm-hmm. and the need to to take action to preserve our planet, and uh, it, the the tradition that we have is it is what makes us who we are, not just how we push back against the people who hate us, and um, and I I think we have that opportunity. That's what that's what Jewish American Heritage Month gives us, and we look forward to to capitalizing on that in every way we can. I confess I didn't know that May was was uh, uh, exactly well. No. Nor nor do most people. But um, <laughs> should, should we should we succeed? This is the year they will. Are these the remedies to the the anti semitism that you that you report on in your state of anti semitism? That is the the the, the 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 fact that people are are more worried, uh, feel less secure, uh, are less likely to 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 wear the mug and David or. Yeah, uh, I mean, are, are these the solutions to to talk about uh, how how what the American Jewish experience is like, or uh, are there more important, more more direct uh, uh, approaches that are necessary? Yeah, I, I think it's an important. I mean, it's look, AJC has a a call to action against anti-Semitism that that looks at all of the different ways that we can respond to anti-Semitism, business and social media and journalism uh, and universities and law enforcement. There's a, there are specific ways that everybody can respond to anti-Semitism and we have to advocate for those changes. It's really critically important. Uh, our translate hate document that helps people understand the history of language that's been used for so often to, to persecute Jews that so many people don't even realize is anti-Semitic. Uh, again, it, all of this, this is what we kind of information we put out there ajc.org is is our website i encourage people to take a look that's all important but at the same time yes absolutely we should we should be proud of who we are we should learn more about what we are it's not about it's not about making sure that we have a better understanding of of religious texts Mm -hmm. specifically it's about what our what what that's given to us as Jews and to the societies in which we've lived and to the world overall, um, it it matters that in history books there are pages and pages about all sorts of ancient tribes that that made significant contributions to the world and what those contributions are. Um, usually, the the contributions to the Jewish community are excluded, and yet we're the group that that continues to thrive thousands of years later. That's that is an important part of this, as uh, as again, Darren and I have discussed this, that the fact it, it, it's inconceivable that in another, for another group in America, that they would say, well, 
I'm not really fully whatever that group is. I, I'm just sort of culturally, or I, I don't really care about this piece of who we are. I, I just identify. And the fact is, for us to really thrive, we should be proud to be Jews. And yeah. we should, and, and we need to understand what that means. And again, what that's meant throughout history, not just for us, but for the world as a whole. Before we turn it over to Suzanne and the uh, members of the audience who have who have questions for you, I just say one one challenge you might take up yeah. uh, is is the uh, uh, the oddity of a great many people who uh, will speak and uh, and having interviewed a great many people yeah. in in my life, I, I became acutely aware of it. Will refer to Jewish people, Jewish persons, and uh, avoid saying Jews. Uh, somehow, with the assumption that that would be a a pejorative, that that uh, you're not supposed to call someone a Jew. Uh, I remember a, a a rabbi of mine once sermonizing about this. That, you know, know your name, Jew. You know, that's who we are. Yeah. But a lot of Americans assume that uh, to call someone a Jew uh, uh, or identify them as Jew must must be wrong. But a, a Jewish person would be a, would be a better way of saying. Robert, I I have to I have to admit, until about three months ago. I was unfamiliar with this issue, um, but I, others have now made me aware. And all I can say, as a proud Jew, is <laughs> that you're on. You're definitely onto something here. Okay. All right. Well, let's turn it over to uh, Suzanne, uh, Suzanne, Suzanne Borden, uh, who who has been uh, looking at the questions that our our viewers have been sending in. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, thank you both for that wonderful conversation, very important conversation. I'm going to ask a few questions from the audience with regard to the survey itself. Um, somebody wanted to know, um, uh, it was mentioned that you were reaching average Americans, um, and if a high number of people, uh, in, in terms of the high number of people having warm feelings about Jews are truly represented, um, when we're talking about younger Jews under the age of 35, um, when they're so hard to reach, specifically not answering telephones, um, do these surveys really represent younger generations? And if not, how do you reach them? Um, well, I will I will say that the question of how people feel about Jews, that was that was not our survey. Yeah, that's Pew. Um, yeah, that's Pew's survey. So I, I can't really speak to the their data and, and how they collected it. I do know uh, that there was considerable effort that in ours that went into um, ensuring that we were that we were seek we were we were. I don't I don't know the technical language, but essentially. Uh, working extra hard, I think, is the technology is the is the the uh, specific language. We were really working to make sure that that we were seeking out young um, respondents where they are. Um, it's the 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 way that polling is done, and and uh, I'm confident in what we were able to gather here. But again, we didn't ask questions. We didn't ask those questions about. How do you feel about the Jews in your neighborhood? We ask questions about anti-Semitism and the impact that it has on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, can you briefly discuss uh, at this point where anti-Semitism anti seems to be coming from, whether it's the right, left, other minority communities? Y yes, the answer to that is yes. Look, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I um, it's an it's a really important question. Frankly, um, we have a challenge in in our society. Um, this gets back to what Robert was asking uh, and pointing out the divisions in our own society. It's a lot easier for us to point to things that we're critical of, in this case, uh, obvious, and obviously anti-Semitism, when it comes from people that we disagree with on other issues. And so for, uh, for Democrats, sometimes it's easier to identify anti-Semites, conspiracy theory toting uh, anti-Semites on the far right, uh, then it might be to look to anti-Semites within their own party. Likewise, for Republicans, it is sometimes easier for them uh, and, and politically more beneficial for them to point to, uh, to anti-Semitic statements coming from the far left than from within their party. We can't afford the to have the politicization of anti-Semitism. It is impossible. 
it is just impossible for us to confront this as a community if we start having arguments over which type of anti-Semitism is a greater threat. We have to be able to call it out wherever it comes from, and even more powerfully, if it comes from people that we might otherwise align ourselves with, uh, that's, uh, again, that's that's when it's critically important to speak out. Mm -hmm. And how do we get heard by people who don't want to hear from us? Uh, don't want to hear from us. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. The, the, the person was saying that Jews are being cowed into not complaining. Um, and it's a problem as if we don't count. Oh, 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 great. Yeah. That's a, that's a really important question. We, I can tell you from the work that we do, uh, with, uh, with businesses, for example, that we do anti-Semitism training for, for DEI official officers, for, uh, for for corporate employee um, facing groups, and often and this, we do the same thing at universities. There is uh, there is a real challenge. I think this is what they're getting to. There is a real challenge in helping people understand what's actually happening in the Jewish community. That this perception that Jews that that the focus um, should be on groups that are threatened and which groups are threatened marginalized communities well jews don't really come from a marginalized community the argument goes and so it's hard to figure out how to respond well when when given the opportunity to fully explore the jewish experience what we're experiencing today the employees who uh, who feel the same threats that we've seen elsewhere in our survey, who, who feel uncomfortable in parts of their workplace, students who feel uncomfortable in certain parts on certain parts of their campus because of who they are, they can't be dismissed because they don't check a box of, of uh, easily identifiable marginalized group. Um, they have their lived experiences matter also. And so we're the, the irony is that Jews for so long fought to be included in society. Uh, when we were excluded from na certain neighborhoods and from certain jobs and uh, and from certain universities, and and we be we were so successful at inclusion that now when there are threats to the community, we have to work doubly hard to make sure people understand why why our concerns and fears are also valid. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what role, if any, does media play in a part? Um, in promoting anti-Semitism or dismantling it? Uh, it's a really interesting question. Look, I um, I think there, well, there's, there is, there's media as a whole. You've got the same, same issues um, in print media and TV media, and there, there are editorial decisions that get made all of the time. And if those, if those decisions again start with a, uh, a either a failure to acknowledge the threats that the Jewish community feels, uh, or when it comes to Israel, frankly, um, start from from a place more aligned with those who whose goal is to under, is to delegitimize the very existence of the state of Israel. Obviously, that feeds into the narrative that uh, that we see play out that puts so many people, makes so many people uneasy. So we work to to try to provide education there as well. Uh, I I believe, we believe deeply in free speech, uh, but that means that free speech should be available to everyone. And on a college campus, for example, when a when a group marches chanting that Intifada is the only solution, um, it's they may march, they may have the right to to speak out. AJC works hard with university administrators, presidents, uh, deans of student life to help them understand that and remind them that they too, they too have the right to speak out. And in setting uh, a tone for the campus, which is a, a an important focus of what they do much of the time, to never allow groups to to feel under threat that their ability to speak out is important too. So whether it's media, whether it's other areas, the, the need to, to be clear about facts uh, and history, I think matters a lot.
Yeah, may I just say, but yeah. if I understand what you're saying, it's important, you're saying, for, say, the American Jewish Committee or all of us to communicate to the American population at large that just because we're a prosperous minority, uh, just because we are we are not uh, uh, suffering from a 25% unemployment rate, doesn't mean that uh, uh, acts of anti-Semitism or insensitivity uh, don't hurt. Uh, they hurt. Yeah, that's that's absolutely part of it, Robert. And then another part of it is is also helping people understand the the diversity of the Jewish community that we discussed earlier. The yeah. the fact that Jews in in America uh, come from many different places and uh, and and demographically uh, aren't all successful. There are there are people in the Jewish community who suffer who struggle just like people in other communities. Uh, there are um, there are there are Jewish members of the uh, of the black community and the LGBT community and and other communities who face other struggles as well and 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 being reminded of of that diversity not just reminded but in many instances taught uh, of that diversity also helps them understand the the challenges that are also unique mm -hmm. to the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, uh, how much of the increased expression of anti-Semitic sentiment and activity represents organic growth in hate and how much is actually increased willingness of haters to come into the open? Yeah, boy, that's that's the most important question. And I I, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, we we know that at moments when there are and when, when there's a breakdown in belief in institutions, we know that when people start to question legitimacy of, of the government, we, we see an increase in anti-Semitism. And, and but as we've seen over uh, recent years, the combination of the conspiracies around COVID, uh, January 6th, and so, so many of the conspiracies about the, the election, they're just, uh, they, they create an environment that is ripe for for scapegoating and it's the jews who who are so often the victims of that scapegoating so i, I don't know how much of it is new but i do know that uh, that we've seen this increase that impacts the way the jewish community feels in this country uh and that it warrants our serious attention the goal we know i'll say one last thing on this um we we know that there have been anti-semites in America, this isn't new. Uh, when when Henry Ford published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, purchased the newspapers that he could do that, um, it was it was with a clear anti-Semitic intent. Father Coughlin and and the speeches that he gave. I mean, there's a history that the the support supporters of the Nazis uh, during World War II. I mean, we we know the history of anti-Semitism in America, uh, but. For the longest time, that anti-Semitism was spread, at least after World War II, for a long period of time, it was spread maybe by meeting in parking lots, handing out flyers to one another, meeting in people's homes, maybe meeting in the woods. Now, social media gives people the opportunity to spread this kind of anti-Semitic uh, hatred far and wide with the click of a mouse. And that whether the numbers that are new versus people who just climbed out from under the rocks, I don't know. But I know that all of it matters. And I know we can never normalize anti-Semitism. That's the, the big fight that we're all engaged in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and as we wrap up, the question we get every time uh, we have a program about anti-Semitism, and, and today is no different, is what can individuals do? Um, you know, there uh, somebody mm -hmm. just put... Um, most Jewish leaders tell Jews to report anti-Semitism, but not how to really take action. Can people get involved in things individually with um, AJC? And also someone wants to know, are organizations working together um, to, to help fight this? Right, that's, so that's, um, those are both really your questions. To the second question, uh, yes, but there needs to be more. Uh, there are, there is this ongoing, there's this increase in the number of groups that are formed to fight anti-Semitism. We look for opportunities to collaborate. I think the, uh, 
if, if one group were able to solve anti-Semitism, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are now. We have to work together. Uh, but as to what people can do, uh, our, I, I mean, I, I always hesitate doing it, but specifically our call to action against anti-Semitism, it, it stresses the importance of a society-wide approach, a nonpartisan approach. It's the effort we've undertaken with the, the Biden administration to help draft a national action plan. Uh, but everybody has a role to play. Our, our call to action, available at AJC.org, I do encourage people to check it out, has specific things that, that can be done, yes, for the executive branch and local and state government and Congress and the media and social media and, and all of that, but also for individuals and um, and whether it's taking a taking a moment and urging social media companies to to take on anti-Semitism more seriously or reaching out to the the Biden administration as they're drafting a national action plan to remind them that uh, it was important for Secretary Blinken to embrace the IRA definition of anti-Semitism to point out that it's not. Uh, a speech code, but instead is a way to identify anti-Semitism so that we combat it. Just as he spoke out, it's important for the administration to hear as they're drafting this plan that the plan should do the same thing. It's important for uh, for people who, who in their professional lives, work at companies uh, who may want to do programming for Jewish American Heritage Month, may want to offer support for Jewish workers. They can work. They can reach out to us and other groups who provide that kind of support. There is an enormous amount that people can do individually. Once you acknowledge that this isn't this isn't an issue for American Jewish Committee and ADL and federations and other Jewish groups, this is a, a mission that the entire country in a nonpartisan and society-wide approach have to tackle. Thank you. And, and, and lastly, um, do you have any specific uh, suggestions uh, for people who experience anti-Semitism? You know, someone tells them they've, they're doing something down or they make an assumption and say something about Jewish bankers. You know, how do people deal with this in their everyday lives? Uh, look, I think it's important uh, it's important for for people to not just sit back and and a- accept that as normal. And so sometimes, if you if you know the person, if you hear someone, if you're comfortable, then point out to them what they're doing. Uh, the reason that we produce Translate Hate uh, uh, is at TranslateHate.org walks through so many of these anti-Semitic tropes. We refer people to that all the time when they say things that they just they should have known they may not have known as anti-Semitic. So people should should call it out directly when they see it. There, during the uh, during the the, the um, really active Black Lives uh, movement, that Black Lives Matter movement that that brought so many people from our community to learn more about what they can do to confront racism, it's a reminder that we have an obligation, all of us, to to actually learn how to confront anti-Semitism, which means calling it out when you see it. Tell people what they're doing. Tell them why it's not acceptable. Uh, I have a lot of college students who say to me, well, when someone wants to start arguing about about whether Israel has a right to exist, how do I respond? And the answer to that is, when you say that only the Jewish state has no, no right to exist, that's anti-Semitism. That's what you need to understand. That's what I want your friends to understand. Um, by standing together and calling it out, we accomplish a lot. And within the workspace, if people see it, then they should come to us. They should they, and they should ask for training. Uh, companies. I'll just finish with this. Companies, colleges, um, more and more high schools. They, they want to confront these issues. They want their employees to feel safe. They want their students to feel safe. They often don't know how to do it. Um, this is the important kind of training we provide. If you ask the company or call us, we're happy to engage. We, we do this. Uh, we do it all the time. And it, and it helps give greater voice to the Jewish employees. Their coworkers then become greater allies for us as well. 
Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ted and Robert, for this extremely important conversation. I've put a link in the chat for AJC's most recent report, The State of Antisemitism in America, as well as the one they mentioned about from the Pew Research Center. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email later this week that will include a link to today's program, as well as links to AJC. I wanna remind everybody to go to momentmag.com where you can sign up for this Thursday's program, with Israeli author Edgar Carrot uh, on his book, Suddenly, A Knock on the Door. And then next week, Why We Need to Help the Uyghur People in China with Alicia Wazell and Josh Rogan. Again, thank you both. Thank you, everyone, for thank joining you. us. And we'll see everybody next time. Thank Thanks, you. Suzanne. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Ted.